Hello. Welcome to my presentation, Using the Black Art of Marketing to Sell Accessibility. Who am I? I'm Stuart Hay. I'm Managing Director of Utopia. I'm also one of its co-founders. Feel free at any point in time, you can reach out to me via Twitter at OhMyDeity or email me at any time via Stuart at Utopia.digital, and that's Stuart spelled as S-T-E-W-A-R-T. I really hope you enjoy the presentation today. I'm looking forward to giving you a bit of my views around how we can better apply marketing to help with accessibility. So at, that, at this point, let's get into it. So you may be wondering who Intopia are. Intopia is a digital agency specializing in accessibility and inclusive design based out of Australia and New Zealand. We operate predominantly in this region, but we do support other organizations beyond it. And our focus is to try and help those organizations do the right thing and become as accessible as we can possibly help them be. Now, with this in mind, one of our challenges we've come across is how do we help them to create as an enjoyable and efficient digital experience for everyone, but also bring them on that journey in a very positive way. And so some of the things I'm going to be talking about here are the things we generally do on a day-to-day -day basis with all our customers and clients and the people we work with uh, to try and help them uh, do as well as they possibly can. So you might be wondering, what does marketing have to do with accessibility? As we all know, accessibility in most jurisdictions around the world is a legal requirement. So why do we need to do anything? If it's a legal requirement, people are just going to be doing it. Unfortunately, that's not actually happening and isn't actually always the case. As we've seen, there are plenty of legal cases out there. We have in Australia, we have the Sydney Olympic Games were sued in 2000. We've heard about the cases in the United States around Winn-Dixie and Domino's Pizza. But for some reason, sites still are inaccessible and we're still finding organizations lack awareness and understanding about what digital accessibility is and why it's actually important. So here's the thing, I've got an image on the slide here, which is a poor woman trying to drag a horse to water. And the woman for me is compliance and the horse is businesses. And this is how I see a lot of the situation happening at the moment. We have people through compliance, legal compliance, trying to drag organizations to the drinking well of water, which is accessibility and doing the right thing. The unfortunate situation here is that, first of all, most businesses usually don't know about the compliance requirement. And even if they know about the compliance requirement or are told about it afterwards, we're usually berating them about it. And it really puts them offside. And in putting them offside, we have a problem because we've immediately now created a new behavioral barrier between us and them, us being the accessibility advocates, them as being the people who are trying to build and deliver services and trying to help them do the right thing. Because it's really not their fault if they don't know about it. I, we can definitely argue this on many different ways, but at the end of the day, if you don't know about something in the first place, really doesn't go down very well when you start to blame someone for something they don't actually know. So with this in mind, we've got to start thinking about this from a slightly different angle. How do we actually help people do the right thing? So Daryl Carnegie said, there's only one way to get anybody to do anything, and that is by making the other person want to do it. Now, this is pretty interesting because that's our challenge. Our challenge is how do we make someone want to do something that they may not be initially inclined to do? Now, I wonder if there's something we can learn about or some science that's out there that can help us with this. And the reality there is, marketing and sales have been around for hundreds of years. Their whole purpose is about how to convince people to buy something or to embrace something that they normally would not have thought to buy or embrace. So what we have here is an opportunity to learn from these classic techniques of marketing to apply it in a positive way towards helping educate and build awareness, brand awareness that is, around accessibility and convince people to come to the table. 
And what I'm going to go through here is a, a number of sort of basic techniques that we've learned over the years, and I've applied these in many different industries before, including accessibility, to try and help educate people, but also help influence people and motivate them to come to the table. And if we can get them to the table, we're halfway to winning that battle of making them want to do something that they may not have thought to do, but in this case, helping them do the right thing on behalf of all those people in the world who could benefit and will benefit from a much more accessible world. So the first technique I want to talk about is omni-channel marketing. Now, one of the biggest challenges many organizations still come across today, or many people come across today, is that there's usually a single voice in an organization championing for accessibility. And unfortunately, it tends to be the lone wolf chirping away, trying to convince others in the organization to do accessibility. And the problem with that is that with any marketing approach, people do not tend to listen to the single channel. What they do listen to is a multi-channel. And this is why when there's a brand out there or, or any sort of um, retailer trying to notify people about something new, they will try to get that communication out through as many different channels as possible, which is the omni-channel marketing concept. So with this, what we are going to look at is what some of those channels are going to be and how can we leverage a single voice so it sounds like multiple voices. So the whole objective here is try and use multiple sources. Could still be the same person behind all those sources, but the receiver does not always necessarily see or realize that it, all, it is all coming from the single source. So the best way of doing this, if you're a single person, and this is all free type objectives that you can get away with here, there's no money needed to do a lot of this stuff. What you can help do to try to leverage and increase your voice is a range of these sort of techniques. So, well, not techniques, but approaches. And so the approaches could be something as simple as putting out a newsletter. Now, a newsletter is not that difficult to do. With a newsletter, your objective could be to try and get like 10 out across a year, so roughly once a month. Content, yeah, that can sometimes be a little bit hard, but content's not too bad because what you can do is subscribe to a, a wide range of newsletters that are already out there. You've got newsletters from other consulting firms. You've got newsletters from associations. You've got amazing uh, Twitter feeds that are out there. LinkedIn uh, influencers are out there all sharing amazing sources of content that you can take and just collate into a simple newsletter along with some localized information for what you want to try and get across into your organization and release that across the organization. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. It could be something as simple as a Word document that you share across the organization or a blog environment uh, if you're using something like Confluence or SharePoint or something along those lines. So that's just one method of trying to increase the number of sources of voice. So now you've gone from a single voice to potentially 10 voices. Each newsletter in their own right is a new instance of a voice. In addition to this, you can do things like brown bags. Uh, we're big fans of, of going into organizations, uh, helping with like a one hour session, uh, where all we do is we talk about what's happening with accessibility uh, or something around accessibility that we can share with an organization. And I've done this when I've been in organizations and what I would used to do was invite external companies and organizations come in and to share their knowledge. Now again, with a brown bag, you can set that up to be a monthly type endeavor. So roughly nine to 10 brown bags a year, call it a seminar series if you want. And based on that seminar series, the technique that I would use is work by threes. So every third session, you might invite someone from outside the organization to come in and share their case study or talk about what they do. So that could be another digital consultancy around accessibility. It could be another organization that has accessibility work that they do that come in and talk about their lessons learned, their challenges, the things they're doing. Um, those sort of people are always willing to share their experiences. That can make up like a third of the content of your brown bag seminar series. 
The other third can be based on uh, case stories from within the organization itself. So it can be the single voice of accessibility, the champion. It could be uh, some of the developers or designers talking about their experiences, maybe sharing something around how they built something on an iOS app to make it accessible and so forth. So now that becomes like a third range of content for you. And the third one in my viewpoint is where, and I strongly encourage this, invite users in who happen to have disabilities to talk about their experiences, their real world experiences. And by getting them in, what you get is a, a, an additional benefit from that because you start to then interact with that community that you should be supporting and helping and looking after. And they're a very important community out there. But so now what we've got is we've added to that 10 newsletters roughly a year, 10 voices and instances. We've now added to that brown bags and we've got now nine to 10 of those brown bags. So we've now got 20 different voices happening. So in addition to then all of that, you start wanting to walk the floor. And walking the floor, that's where you wanna get out and interact with the teams that are out there. You wanna interact with the scrum teams that might be out there, the dev groups, the designers, the procurement team, any and all of them, and you wanna be talking to them. And in talking to them, you add your voice to all of that. Once you get beyond that, the next thing you can look at is like the corporate strategy, trying to get some of the actions and initiatives into the corporate strategy. Now, once you start to stack this all up, none of this really costs you any money, but what it does do, it gets you some massive brand recognition for accessibility across the organization. And it is very cheap and becomes very effective. So my main tip here, my takeaway tip for this is make sure that people hear about accessibility from as many different sources as possible. You should not be the only voice. Do not be the lone voice. Maximize, replicate your voice in as many different ways so that it can never be isolated to a single voice. The more voices you've got, the more powerful you, uh, a chance you have of connecting and reaching people across your organization. Now, I find going hand in hand with the omnichannel marketing is the concept of the rule of seven. So for me, I usually pair the two together, but I've broken them out here separately for the purpose of educating and, and letting you know these different elements to it. But the rule of seven, when combined with omni marketing, for me is this concept of the three by seven rule, where in order for someone to understand and hear about a brand or a concept and become aware of it, they need to have heard about it from three different sources and heard it repeated seven times across those three different sources. So I've already spoken about those three different sort of potential sources in the previous set of slides. But here, the other element to that is the repetition side of things. So I want to stress the fact that the repeatability is so important. It's, it's repeating yourself and repeating yourself and repeating yourself. But there's a reason for this. There's a bit of neurolinguistics behind all of this because the repetition needs to be something uh, that is positive and consistently put out there. And I'll give you the best example of this. The neurolinguistics works on this idea, and you've probably come across this, about these interactions, these multiple positive interactions that you go through. And there's this, there's this sort of theory that through seven positive interactions leads to a positive outcome. But you sort of need to do those seven positive uh, interactions. They have to build up over time. And it's a sort of an old school sales technique where they have this theory that sort of by that sixth or seventh positive interaction, you might get your customer or your client to make or, or make the sale or you're making the sale to them and, and they're buying. Now, you'll see the evil version of this. The evil version of this is the clickbait um, headline sort of article that's on the internet where they go, oh, we have this beautiful article here, give you some information, but in order to get the article, you have to give us your email address and then we'll send it to you. And you'll have seen then what ends up happening is you give them their email address, you get this clickbait article, it's usually really high and fluffy. But the next thing you know, you've got them starting to email you, go, oh, can we have a conversation? Can we have another conversation? Come on, can we have a conversation? What they're trying to do is they're trying to generate these seven interactions. But the problem I've got with that is that's seven negative interactions. The positive interactions is where you might willingly put information out into the world 
demonstrating your experience, demonstrating your thoughts and ideas, demonstrating positive situations, and people receive that. And if they think that is important, that information, they will go looking for more, inf more information. Uh, if you provide uh, multiples of that information, they will start to value that if it is of value to them. And that eventually leads to this concept of sort of that positive um, demeanor towards what you're trying to do. So again, repetition is important, but you've got to combine the repetition with very positive value outcomes from that repetition. So what I was mentioning earlier around about newsletters and what I was mentioning around brown bags, those individual um, sort of solutions that you're putting out there need to create value. There's no use putting a newsletter out there if it's not providing value to the readers in the organization. Uh, there's no use having a brown bag if it's not going to provide value. There are times I actually tried to create value when I brought organizations into organizations I was working for, but they were from high profile organizations. So I might have someone from Google come in and present at my organization. And there's an intrinsic value to Google's brand that I can leverage and build off of to try and promote the message that I'm trying to get out there. So you don't just bring anyone in from Google because that devalues the value of the brand. What you're doing though is if you brought someone in who is an accessibility expert talking about what they're doing, that increases that value. And you repeat that through many different sessions time and time again. And it's that repetition that becomes extremely powerful. So my two takeaway tips from this point is repeat, 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 repeat. You do need to be repetitive. You do need to sound like at times a broken record, but you also need to make sure that the interactions are positive interactions because it says positive interactions that lead to strong relationships with people. And that's what your objective is. You're trying to create a relationship connection. Okay, my third point might sound like an easy one and a simple one, but that's what it is. It's make it easy. Uh, I'm a huge fan of trying to make life as easy as possible for people. Because to be honest, you do not want to be this person. So I have a picture up here of a white walker from the Game of Thrones TV series. And the white walkers are out there to hurt you. And it's like anything else. It's not necessarily a white walker, but you don't want to be the compliance Nazi. You don't want to be the auditor in the worst way in interpretation of that word. Because to be honest, who likes to be audited by the tax department? Nobody wants to be audited by the tax department. We're, there's a fear level to that. There's a scare element, a scary element to that. And it's all about trying to enforce people and, and sort of slap people around the, the, the ears in a sense of try to doing the right thing. But you're doing that through fear and fear does not tend to create a long and lasting strong relationship. It doesn't encourage people to do the right thing. You may have come across the old saying, you catch more flies with honey. And that's true. And for me, when you're in an organization, that is what your objective is. Your objective should be trying to make it as easy as possible for organizations to do the right thing. So for us in Entopia, as an example, we, we sort of pride ourselves on being very pragmatic about helping organizations do the right thing. We've got some organizations that have thousands of digital assets. And there's no use, uh, use us going into those organizations and saying, you have to make that all accessible today because it's not practical. It's not going to happen. It is completely uh, distorted from the reality of those organizations and the internal pressure points and challenges they've got. Now, I'm not going to judge them on their prioritizations because, again, that's not my job to judge them. And I am coming at this more from a consultant's perspective here. But to me, also, if you're the internal accessibility advocate in an organization, you are also an internal consultant. And here's the thing. If, though, you create an environment of trust, you create an environment of practical uh, and pragmatic advice and support, and you're easy and approachable to work with, not prickly, what ends up happening is 
you start to create this scenario of people trusting to want to come and work with you because they don't fear you so much. They know that you're someone who's there to help them out when they need the help. You're not there to try to enforce things on them. Now, there's probably going to be an element of that where in the organization you need to do that, but there's still ways of how you can create the enforcement arm of your work without you necessarily needing to be the bad cop. You can do that by having a escalation point to the CIO of the organization, the CTO of the organization, uh, an escalation point to an executive group who need to sign off on things that do not meet policy, for example, which allows you as a single voice or the accessibility expert to take a different approach where you can say, yeah, I'm here to help you. These are our policies. We need to try and meet our policies, but let's work together on how we can get you as far along those policies as possible. And if we do need to, or you do believe that you can't reach those policies requirements, I won't necessarily say no to you, but you have to go through this other group to get approval. So again, you're still enforcing the, the, the policies and the processes for your organization but you're sort of able to play that line of being the good cop and not necessarily the bad cop in the situation. We found a lot of our uh, sort of relationships we've built over time with a lot of the organizations we've worked with has come from that perspective of people working with us and going, oh, guys, you are so, you're so passionate, but you also understand what our business uh, sort of challenges are and our business requirements and our limitations. Now, whether those limitations are correct, whether, as I said, whether those priorities are appropriate is really in a lot of occasions, not something we should be judging them on. What we should always be trying to do is help them get as far along as possible. At the same time, the way we provide information, present information should be done in a way that helps organizations know how to pragmatic, pragmatically start those early steps to get uh, down the path of becoming more accessible. I would rather see momentum in an organization where they are making substantive incremental steps in the right direction versus creating a scenario of a um, um, go or no go type scenario where they either have to do it all or do nothing. Because to be honest, the easiest approach for them is to do nothing. So if you give them a binary type response of you have to do everything or nothing, you're probably going to lose that 99% of the time. If you give them those incremental steps, what you're going to find is they'll find that easy. And once they get the first couple steps done, oh, that wasn't too hard. Then they move on to the next steps and the next steps and the next steps. And so what you end up doing is you're playing a long game, you're not playing that short game. And that's so important. So my three takeaway tips here um, are be approachable. So it's always important to not be prickly, not be the um, compliance person. You want to be the person that's there to help them. Do not judge them. It is not our role to be judgmental of other people. Nobody likes someone judging you for what you do or what you don't do. Again, by judging people, you build distrust with people or distrust to you and it doesn't help the cause of what you're trying to achieve. So don't judge. What you want to be doing is being non-judgmental. You are meant to be a bipartisan, uh, sort of a, well, what's the right term, bipartisan expert or, or person you're there to be neutral for all intents and purposes, obviously with a, a bent to doing the right thing. And lastly, be there to help. You're there to be helping them. You're not there to be slapping them around. So if you're being, approachable, non-judgmental, and helpful, you're going to make other people's lives easy, and that's going to make your life easy to get them to do the right thing. Now, the first three points I find are actually relatively straightforward and easy and uh, for most people to sort of get their heads around and, and do something about an action. This fourth step is about the psychology of persuasion, and it's a little bit more trickier. Now, Part of the mistakes I've seen people make is that they are so busy and focused on trying to represent this large, diverse uh, group of society, which is the disability community, that they forget that what they're trying to communicate to is an even larger, diverse uh, community of 
different thinking approaches and behaviors and personality types. And as part of this, what we have to remember is that we have to connect with that group. So what I'm going to talk about here is a few different ways of how we can do this. Now on my screen is I've got a slide. I've got a sl slide, an old black and white slide of 12 white guys. 12 white guys around the table, a few of them with their hands up. Now this is a slide from a very old movie called 12 Angry Men. And 12 Angry Men was a short movie. It went for, I think, about 90 minutes. And one of the amazing things about this movie was it was a classic um, sort of provider of the art of persuasion. And the fundamental basis of this is it's 12 jurors um, sitting on a court case uh, for a unfortunate uh, black man who is being trialed for murder. And in this jury room, they're debating on how they're going to vote and 11 of them are voting guilty and one guy isn't. And the whole movie is about how that one juror systematically goes about convincing all other 11 jurors to his view that the poor man was not guilty. Now, this is a movie set in a certain time and frame and from all political correctness, let's step aside from that and get to the underlying message here of what it's trying to portray. What it's trying to portray here is that in this particular regard, another one person needed to convince 11 other people and had to use 11 different ways to convince them. So he did everything from um, trying to blackmail them, threaten them, cajole them, uh, reason with them. All of that is what he tried to do. And he systematically did that for 11 different people. And eventually, by the end of the movie, brought them all online. Now, here is really a sample set of what we're dealing with in life. In life, we're dealing with 11 different jurors all the time, 11 different personality types, and they all have different reasons for what they believe in. They have all their own biases. They also have all their own motivators. And these are the people in life that we are trying to connect with and to trying to convince to our way of thinking. So how do we do that? So we do this by working on a number of different ways to connect with people because one way is not good enough. And to date, what I've found from when I entered this industry sector, which is the digital accessibility and disability industry sector, is that we seem to want to default to the compliance argument all the time, which is basically threatening people to do the right thing. And from my perspective, threatening people to do the right thing is not a very strong argument, particularly when it's not enforceable or not heavily enforceable or doesn't easily get enforced. It, it does happen. We do have the case examples like Domino's and, and Winn-Dixie, and there's a number of them out there. But it's not enough to convince the majority of people to do the right thing. So what we have to now do is we need to learn a suite of different techniques to try and motivate as many different people as possible because you don't know what is going to be the motivation for a particular individual. And so you've got to match up a motivation technique to each different individual that's out there. Now, what do I mean by that? So for some people out there, they're going to be facts and numbers people. To me, sometimes I think of, of them as the Vulcans from Star Trek. Uh, very logical, very rational, and they need logical and rational arguments. They are not generally swayed by this is the right thing to do argument because that is not what sways them. What they are swayed by are facts and numbers. They want to hear things like, the buying power, the, the actual spending power of people with disability will sway them. They want to hear things like people with disabilities spend more per transaction than people without disabilities. They want to hear about uh, people with disabilities are sticky customers uh, and stay longer with brands. These are all known facts that are out there. So these are the type of information we want to use to sway someone who's a facts and numbers person. And so you have to have that at your ready. 
But on the flip side, facts and numbers do not affect other people in the community. So what I'd call more the empaths of the, com the community, the, the sort of nurse style, doctor style, maybe not sometimes always the doctor, but the nurse style uh, um, sort of behavioral people in our community, um, they are heart on the sleeve type people. And for them, facts and numbers do not connect with them. They, they don't rationalize in that way. They rationalize in an emotional way. And so you need to make an emotional connection with them. And there are many different ways of making an emotional connection. Sometimes that's where you're sort of talking about the, the, the person who can't transact and thus they can't buy um, their daily household um, uh, consumption articles online because you haven't designed something correctly. So with those people, that is what you're trying to do. You're trying to connect with them on the emotional level. I also find with the emotional side of things, that is where having those empathy sessions where you bring real world people into an organization to talk about their real experiences and encounter them firsthand and see them as real people becomes really powerful for the impasse of our social uh, group that we're trying to convince. So that is um, one of those different techniques that we can use to try and connect and motivate that part of the community. There is another part out there. They are the reputational risk people. So they're the ones that are so defensive about their personal brand or their organizational brand. And yeah, we know that there is a, there's a risk out there that if you were to be seen to do the wrong thing, we've all come across these people. That I, I find them quite, um, difficult to sort of deal with at times because they have that veneer of, of empathy, but the reality is they're not actually truly empathetic. What they are is, is they are more the rationalists. They're the, in a different way, but they're, they're more about that reputational risk to themselves and to an organization. And until they they believe that their reputation is going to be put at risk and, and see how that reputation is going to be put at risk, they tend not to value situations in the same way that you and I might value. Uh, or though, then again, you might be one of those people that are like that. That's not saying they're bad people in any way. It's just that is what is their motivator. So with those sort of people, that's where you want to focus on talking about the brand risk to the organization, the personal risk that, hey, if you've signed off on this or you've allowed this to happen, this may look bad on you as an individual if it gets out there. So that's another way of how we can sort of motivate that particular group of people. The other one I love is the geek out factor. Um, for me, our major crowd that we're trying to convince is usually the people at the cold face of digital technology. So that's your designers, your developers, your testers, um, and also sometimes your business analysts and, and so forth. For me, that group of people, there is parts of that group who really have that geek out factor to them. So new technology, the coolness factor of technology, the coolness factor of new techniques, all this sort of stuff. I love connecting with that group. Sometimes they annoy the hell out of me because they're also that same group that goes, oh, let's try something new for the sake of doing something new uh, without fully thinking through what that impact of that change is going to be on those people around them. But for me, that is also the group that gets really uh, sort of geeked out on seeing things like someone interacting with technology using a screen reader or using that technology like a mobile phone without the, the screen on and fully interacting with technology. Uh, someone who's using um, uh, head uh, sticks and so forth, like all that really amazing technology adaption we've got in the world to help people with disabilities to interact with the world around them is a coolness factor for a part of the of society out there. So let's play that up in a positive way, that coolness factor that's there around that technology, because that will resonate with some people out there. And that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to connect with them and resonate. You've probably come across that situation where someone has seen a screen reader for the first time and for the next couple of weeks they're talking about how oh i saw this person with a screen reader it was going so fast that i couldn't understand what it was trying to say 
but the person was interacting with it, understood it, they could hear it clearly, they, they were able to operate so quickly. Again, it's that coolness factor. So working towards that is a really important thing to aim for. Another way we can focus on connecting with people's personal benefit, I'll be honest, I've come across people who they're interested in things where they are made to look good. So this is subtly similar, but different to the reputational risk. These are the people that you sort of go, hey, if, if you support this sort of uh, process or support this project and you can be the name sponsor on the project or you can be part of this project, it's going to be successful and you're going to look good at the end of this. So again, if it helps someone, uh, if you can connect with them in that sense, that's yeah, maybe a little bit on the greed side, but at the end of the day, that's their motivator. So understand the motivator and work on ways to connect with that. Now, my last point is bribery. Oh, sorry, no, I don't actually mean bribery in the financial sense, but there is the bribery from the perspective of behavioral inducements. Now, I've got a bunch of colleagues who love to bake food, and when they are working with project teams, they love to take in baked goods as almost reward inducements for when they've, good, when they've done good things. So I've seen people do cupcakes and they put braille on the cupcakes and brought that into the office as a reward, but also sort of demonstrating to people uh, so that accessibility requirement to it. I've, I've had people bring in cakes and brownies and, and cookies and, at the end of the day, from my perspective is, as long as it's above board and legal, if you can do anything to reward people for doing good behavior, then that is something you should try to do because it leads to positive encouragement for uh, more behavior, particularly the behavior we're looking for. So a couple of years ago, I was given this presentation at CSUN. I have to admit, we bribe people with Tim Tams. Uh, for those people who don't know what a Tim Tam is, a Tim Tam is a chocolate sort of biscuit cookie here in Australia. And for those people not in Australia, it's usually the equivalent of crack cocaine. It is a very sweet chocolatey uh, sort of biscuit, which people seem to really love. Um, I took that with me to CSUN uh, to sort of share in that way. I've also heard of other people doing the same thing out of Europe with things like stroop waffles. Um, so whatever it is, look for a way to, for that positive encouragement for people. So my tips here are everyone does not have the same motivators and you need to recognize that. You also need to tailor your approach to your audience. There's no use using a motivator technique that applies to someone who is not motivated by that technique. So you need to work that out. You need to find out what is the motivator for the right person and connect that. And sometimes if you're not sure what that is, I generally recommend do a full sweep of everything. So your best motivators is doing a bit of everything until you work out what is going to connect with So that is my four different sort of techniques I want to share with you about marketing and how you can use that to help convince people to do the right thing. Now, I've applied these techniques over the years in different industry sectors uh, across different technology bases, and I've found them, uh, I've found that they work fairly consistently and they're not that difficult if you apply them in a simple way. Uh, Usually it helps you can, to get some of that mo motivation going. And I've seen other people have been doing the exact same techniques and also being successful. I've also heard people complain to say, oh, I can never do this or I need funding or money to do something. Well, the reality is, is that you've got to build up that goodwill and trust with people before that leads to sometimes those financial supports to really take things further. But again, it's all about building that momentum in the right direction. I'd love to connect with you outside of this presentation. If you want to know more or talk to me about things that have worked for you or share ideas or learn more about some of the things we've done, feel free to reach out to me. Again, my Twitter uh, email or my Twitter uh, profile is OhMyDAT. You can email me at Stuart, which is S-T-E-W-A-R-T at Intopia.digital. 
and you can find these slides uh, online at bit.ly, so B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Black Art, A Future Date. Thank you very much for your time.